While Hackmatack reaches readers and writers beyond our region, our office is located in Chibuktuk, also known as Halifax, and our program is based in the Atlantic provinces. We would like to acknowledge the land where our program takes place. The Hakmatak Future Voices Showcase is produced in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wolostokiuk peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolostokiuk title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people, and we have rights and responsibilities as Mi'kmaq and settlers. Hakmatak is committed to allyship, and we have pledged to do our best to amplify the voices of Mi'kmaq people. Hi, I'm Ray Fernandez, a youth service librarian with the Nova Scotia Provincial Library, based in Mi'kmaq, Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm also a board member of the Hakmatak Children's Choice Book Award. Each year, Hackmatak presents our shortlisted titles in four different categories, English and French, fiction and nonfiction, that highlight exceptional Canadian books for readers in grades four to six. And of course, our readers, children in Atlantic Canada, who participate in the program, read these shortlisted books and choose the winners. Our goal is to present diverse shortlists and ensure that every young reader can see themselves represented in literature. Moreover, we believe that all children benefit from learning about the diversity of the wider world, whether or not it is reflected in their own communities. While we have pledged an equity approach in our selection process and are encouraging publishers to submit a greater diversity of books for our awards, we acknowledge that we can play a more active role in supporting BIPOC authors and illustrators. We use the acronym BIPOC to refer to people who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of colour. We know that there are many BIPOC creators writing and illustrating great books and stories for children. And we want to share their work with our community of young readers, parents, teachers, and librarians. We're excited to introduce you to just a few of the up and coming BIPOC creators who are working in children's literature across Canada. We hope you enjoy meeting them in our future Voices Showcase. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kiran Jothgore and I'm the author of Sangeet and the Missing Beat, a children's picture book published by Rebel Mountain Press, released earlier this year and available wherever you buy books. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the book today and also tell you a little bit about myself, but first I wanted to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Kitsi First Nations, also known as Surrey. In my life I've had the privilege to pursue many interests including having a degree in civil engineering. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in earthquake engineering at UBC. Um, in addition to being a first time author, I'm also an artist and a busy mom of three. Uh, in my artistic practice and in my life, I like to explore the different artistic influences that have really made me who I am. And those include my background, uh, my technical background in engineering, as well as having a Punjabi and Sikh heritage uh, growing up in a family fabric store and also living here on the west coast of Canada. So I first wrote Sangeet and the Missing Beat after my eldest daughter was born and I really wanted to create a character who inspired her to dream big and to face her challenges and also maybe a character who kind of looked like her. So growing up, although it was a diverse community, didn't have a lot of TV shows, cartoons and books that had characters and homes that really looked like my home and my family. So that was one of the motivations to creating characters. Um, I do sometimes get people who see the illustrations and say, hey, is that you guys? Is that your daughter? And is that your husband? Is that your family? And I just love that question because although the characters are not exactly who I am and are not really my family, um, they could be and they do represent people who look like me. So I think that's wonderful. I really wanted the illustrations to be something that kids could copy and that they could draw themselves. Because when I was little, if I saw something that I liked, I'd always try to draw it because in that way, I felt like I was able to keep it. So I drew everything by hand uh, using pencil and markers. I really hope that kids will 
try to recreate some of the characters and create characters of their own and write stories of their own. So a little bit about the story. Sangeet is a vibrant spirited little girl who loves music and who plays the tabla, her favorite instrument. One day um, while she's at school on the playground, she's inspired by some sounds to recreate a beat. So she comes home and she tries to play, but she finds that something is missing. So the story follows Sangeet as she tries to complete her beat and is encouraged by her family and one very special teacher in her life. Sangeet and the Missing Beat. Sangeet loves music. She can play five different instruments and she can sing too. She's always composing something new and telling everyone about her musical tunes and rhythms. Her favorite instrument is the tabla. The tabla is handmade and each player who plays it makes their own unique sounds. It is amazing. Sangeet has seen many men and a few women play tabla, but of course, anyone can do anything. Someday, Sangeet is going to be a tabla master. One day after school, Sangeet had exciting news. Dad, 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 the most super duper best thing ever happened at recess today. There were noises everywhere. The teeter-totter was bouncing, the swings were squeaking, and all the kids were laughing and screaming. Then, through it all, I heard the most incredible beat in my head. It's perfect for my tabla. I'll play it now so you can hear it too. Sangeet's dad smiled and raced her to her room. Sangeet sat down crisscrossed at her tabla. She flexed her fingers and gave her wrist a good shake. Then she took a deep breath, straightened her posture, and began to play. Din din da ge tit She tried again. Din din da ge tit kit. Hmm, still not quite right. She looked at her dad in confusion. Dad, I've got half a beat stuck in my head and there's something missing. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I'm sure you'll figure it out. You always do, Singeet's dad replied with confidence. So that was a little snippet of the story. I hope you'll enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed creating it. There are some teacher resources also available at rebelmountainpress.com. Thank you so much. My name is Emily Seo, and I am a Japanese Canadian author based in Richmond, British Columbia. And my debut novel, The Science of Boys, will be coming out next month. It's illustrated by the talented Gracie Zhang and published by Tradewind Books. And it is an upper middle grade novel, so it's for ages 11 to 14. And it's essentially a story about a science-minded girl who is studious but awkward and struggles to fit in. And so when a popular girl at school makes it known that she has a crush on a highly sought after boy, the main character says that she can help because she's writing a book about the science of boys. So, of course, she knows nothing about boys, but luckily her science knowledge keeps her afloat. But she could only keep up her lies for so long, so we will see what happens to her. Okay, so my background is in the sciences. I have a PhD in chemistry from the University of British Columbia. And I don't have much of a background in children's literature. However, I've always wanted to write for children. So for over a decade now, I've been taking classes, workshops, participating in critique groups and going to conferences, attending as many writing um, seminars as possible so I could really learn about the craft of writing. Of course, reading a lot as well in the genre that I'm writing. I didn't maybe necessarily choose the age group. What I was writing ended up going into this age group because I was sitting on the cusp of writing middle grade or YA uh, at a point we didn't know, well, I didn't know which way to go, but I was presenting it at my critique groups. And then the feedback that I got made me realize that it's more of a middle grade novel. So that's how it went. But um, yeah, how was it? So of course, there are my own experiences and my memories from high school, but things have changed a lot since then. So what I did was I asked a bunch of preteens and teenagers <laughs> questions about their life in high school, and they gave me a lot of insight in how things are different.
I believe it is the science behind it. Of course, I am a scientist. What I did was I integrated a, a science law theory or concept into every chapter heading. And so that is what guided what I was writing at the beginning. And then I ordered them so it made some sort of sense. And then, of course, they were truncated, so I had to remove some and add a few others. But uh, it is the science that really guided me at the beginning. So the book is set in Easton, British Columbia, and I actually have a few images up there. It's one of my favorite places. And uh, so that also inspired me, just being at the fisherman's dock, walking around the village, all the sweet shops, whether it's ice cream or chocolates. Um, so all of that inspired me. Don't pretend to be someone you're not, because those who like you will like you for who you are. And so you don't have to try so hard. And I think that is probably the most important message. Um, but I should also say, uh, there's a lot of maybe underlying messages as well. The book starts off where the character um, thinks of people as being quite different, and she compares them to different cell types. So like bone cells, muscle cells, uh, stem cells. And then at the end of the book, she realizes how similar everyone is and how everyone has their own struggles. And so another point would be to be kind to one another because everyone does have their own struggles and uh, being kind is a choice. And so that is something to be aware of. Yeah, really, if you enjoy writing to just write, and see what we come up with. But um, if you want to write a book, I recommend or suggest reading a lot of books in that same genre. But really it's just about writing and writing. And a lot of the times you might think that your writing is not good enough or it's not going, your storyline's not going anywhere, but unless you keep going, you'll never ever know. And so for me, this was many years. It's, <laughs> it was a process for sure. And for me, it was like experimenting. So. I just kept on writing and writing. And I guess one good thing about not having a background, a formal education in writing is that anything anybody said, I was willing to try because I was so new at it. I didn't, because um, science writing is quite different than writing prose or writing a story. So anything, any suggestions anyone gave me, I, I played a lot with those. And I believe that helped me become a better writer. So just, yeah, don't be scared to try new things and just keep going because as long as you don't give up, you can't fail. Yeah, so I'm currently working on a novel. So it's a middle grade novel again, but it is my first book that contains an element of magic. And this project actually is supported um, by the Canada Council for the Arts. So that was a nice treat to get, get the, the message that I won this grant. So it is helping me a little bit write this novel. Um, so it is about a Japanese Canadian um, and she does start, the story starts off in Canada, but she ends up going to Japan to meet her grandmother for the first time. And so there's a lot of um, multi-generational um, stories, but it's also um, to do with the environment. So The Science of Boys is a middle, middle grade novel. It will be coming out in June of 2022, and it will be at Kids Books, uh, Book Warehouse, Black Mom Books, Indigo, Amazon. You can find the pre-order links on my website at emilysalewrites.com. And if you're interested, you can follow me uh, on my Twitter or Instagram handle at emilysalewrites. Hi there, thanks for tuning in. My name's Farah Quasar. And my name is Hajo Nakua. We're so excited to share our upcoming children's picture book with you all today at the Hackman Tack Future Voices Showcase. But before we dive into our book, we wanted to tell you a little bit more about ourselves. So I'm a genomics researcher by training. I completed a Master of Science at the University of Toronto where I carried out DNA sequencing to better understand different neurological disorders. Over the years, I've written about science for media outlets, co-founded the Toronto Science Policy Network, and even created pages about scientists on Wikipedia. Now I'm taking a detour into the world of policy. Specifically, I'm the Director of Research and Policy at Evidence for Democracy, which is a policy nonprofit. 
I'm a neuroscientist completing my PhD at the University of Toronto. I study the relationship between brain organization and mental health symptoms in children using brain images from magnetic resonance imaging. I really enjoy bilingual science communications and I have an Instagram account in which I share cool neuroscience and graduate school information in both Arabic and English. But enough about us. You may be sitting there and thinking, all right, why are two scientists writing a children's picture book? Absolutely, I would be too. So it may come as no surprise that today there are still so many people who are underrepresented across the sciences in North America, from women to people of color. And this underrepresentation has very real consequences. For example, children are less likely to pursue careers where they do not see themselves represented. Studies show that in North America, when asked to draw scientists, more children are drawing women as scientists than ever before. But as children grow older, they tend to draw more men as scientists compared to women. And today, there are lots of children's books about science, such as Andrea Beattie's Ada Twist, Scientists, and the Magic School Bus series. We love these books, but we noticed that there weren't any children's picture books that featured a Muslim girl exploring science, and we wanted to change that. It's hard to be what you can't see, and truly, representation matters. And this gap in representation is what our upcoming book will address. So, Hajar. What can people expect in Khadija and the Elephant Toothpaste Experiment? Well, our book is all about Khadija. After visiting a local science fair, five-year-old Khadija attempts to recreate an elephant toothpaste experiment at home, leading to foamy trouble in the kitchen. Readers like you will follow Khadija's journey towards loving science, exploring it with her family, and then ultimately becoming a scientist. And what we're really excited about is that our book, Khadija and the Elephant Toothpaste Experiment, will help draw children into the world of science, a world they belong in. Of course, this book would not be possible without the help of so many incredible people. We want to extend a huge shout out to our literary agent, Calvin Karn at K2 Literary. Thank you for helping us share Khadija's story with the world. We also want to thank our publisher, Second Story Press, and our editor, Jordan Ryder, for believing in us and little Khadija. Our book is coming out in spring 2024, but in the meantime, you can keep in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or check out our websites. Two years feels like such a long time, but the clock is already ticking fast. We can't wait until we can share Khadija and the Elephant Toothpaste Experiment with all of you in 2024. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Hanako Masutani, and I really appreciate being invited to this Future Voices Showcase. It is wonderful that BIPOC writers are being highlighted. This is something that I have valued for a long time. I used to be an editor for Rice Paper Magazine, which is a literary magazine run by, written by Asian Canadian writers. Uh, so it's lovely to see that these adventures are still very much going on. And I see a lot more BIPOC writing out there, which is fantastic. I usually write for adults. I have published poetry and nonfiction and fiction. I have just started writing for kids, which is very exciting because I have three kids of my own. Um, I remember being a kid well, and so I have written and uh, I've written, I have read a ton of children's books and enjoyed them so thoroughly. They're full of the kind of courage and optimism that I wish some adult books also had. Uh, to tell you a bit more about myself, my dad is from Japan, my mom is from England, they are both immigrants. I grew up on a tiny rock here in BC called Denman Island. Um, the beaches look a bit like that. But I currently live in Vancouver on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And it is been a beautiful place to be born and raised, and I feel extremely lucky.
In Vancouver, I am instructor at colleges, various colleges, and I teach English literature and academic writing, which is fun, I have to say. I also have, as I said, three kids to parent. Two of them have dyslexia, so I have read a lot of stories to them. As far as writing goes, the thing that helps me the most is having a group. I have had the same writers group of just three women writers for seven, eight, nine years now. And we cheer each other on and they're doing so well in their writing too. And having that accountability system in place really helps and makes things more fun so you're not writing in solitary in solitude so that's what I recommend for people writing okay so I'm going to read you just a few pages from my kids book called Emmy and Me here we go Emmy and Minnie. Text is by me, Hanako Masutani, and the illustrations are by Stefan Jorish, who also illustrated Suki's Kimono, if you've had a chance to read that book. Also with beautiful drawings. We're hopping into chapter four here. So as I said, this is about an Asian Canadian girl in Vancouver. She lives with a single mom in an apartment, and they've moved from, from the countryside to the city, and Emmy desperately wants a dog, but they're not allowed dogs in their little apartment. Chapter 4. We park outside the animal shelter on the way home from school on Friday. Mom turns in her front seat and looks at me. Emmy, try to keep an open mind. I know. I will. I'm lucky I can get a pet, even if it can't be a dog. The room with the small pets is loud with animal sounds and smells, kind of like a barn and kind of like a hospital. It's noisy and a bit gross. But there are stacks of cages, all full of pets, guinea pigs, bunnies, even a parrot. Mom and the shelter worker talk about good restaurants. That is something adults seem to love to talk about. I give each pet a hard look. You're scruffy, I say to one, eating weed. Another rodent is running on a wheel. You know you're not going anywhere, right? From right beside me, I hear a sudden squeak. I turn to see who's making the sound. Okay, so in that last slide there, you see Emmy, the human, and Minnie, the hamster. And what inspired me to write this story was that, first of all, I grew up, they say in the countryside, with a ton of pets. And I think I had a ton of pets because I was very shy as a kid. And animals were easier companions than other kids. And more accepting, one might say. And I had a hamster as a kid. I also had a pony and dogs and ducks and geese and donkeys and sheep and et cetera, et cetera. But I did have a hamster. So I wrote about Amy and Minnie and their relationship, because that's generally what I like to write about is uh, well, race, relationships, and nature slash animals. And that is what we see here in Emmy and Minnie. And 
the reason I like writing about relationships is because they're not straightforward, even with an animal, even with ourselves at times. So I hope you will enjoy Emmy and Minnie. As I say, it's coming out in 2023 by Tradewind Books. And I hope you get a chance to find it and enjoy it. Thank you again for inviting me. My name is Nadia Davy Amadat. I am from Toronto, Ontario, and my book is titled The Most Beautiful Thing I Have Ever Seen with Second Story Press. Um, the book is about a refugee family, primarily a little girl, coming to Canada from a conflict situation, a war, um, and just figuring out to, how to navigate her new world. So being really excited to be here, but also dealing with constant war reminders or just unusual situations that she's never experienced before. Uh, it will be a picture book, um, and the age range will be ages six to nine years old. I will be working with an illustrator. It's Christine Way. Uh, she's going to be uh, illustrating her second, this will be her second children's book. Um, so being an author just kind of happened haphazardly. Um, by training, I'm a social worker, and I work for an organization called the Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture. Um, and so a lot of the experiences in the book are actually based on my work with uh, Syrian children, uh, youth, and their families um, beginning in 2016, as we were starting to see a lot of these folks arrive in the area. So what had happened is that during the pandemic, I was actually writing... Um, some of these instances in like a more academic professional way for different publications for our organization. Um, and I guess combined with like pandemic angst and just kind of feeling stuck and having all these big ideas in my head, it was just kind of a way to get this out to a wider audience because, you know, we're seeing refugees and asylum seekers in unprecedented waves. And it's not gonna be uncommon that many folks will start meeting them in their communities. And, and how do we support these people who just really need the additional um, encouragement and help with navigation? It was terrifying. Um, <laughs> you know, I was thinking even when I was a child, I wasn't writing for other kids. It was writing for my teachers. Like it was so hard to think about like having to make it meaningful, but in a way that we could understand without kind of like shrinking the, the enormity of the topic. Um, so it was really tough. And I was worried that maybe it was too mature. I think after like a few revisions and a few drafts and a, a, and a lot of pulling my hair out, <laughs> it's, uh, it started to take more shape. You know what, I have to say that it was, knock on wood, pretty seamless. Um, it was one of, uh, I think, three publishers I originally had sent it out to. The One didn't respond, one passed on me, and Second Story was like, hey, you know, this could be something here. Um, so it was pretty good, but I mean, I, I can definitely see how it can be a difficult process. There's, it, there's a lot of waiting, and then also it seemed like everyone was writing books during the time of the pandemic, so like it, was, it took a long time for, for me to get a response, and I kind of almost started to be like, well, you know, I gave it a shot, maybe another time, and it, and it just so happened they got back to me, so it, it was a really positive process. Do you know what? I know this sounds cliche, but really perseverance is key. Um, you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea and it's nothing personal. It just means it's not a good fit for that publisher at the time. Uh, there's so many ways that you can publish now. If you really don't think that maybe it's going well with finding a traditional publisher, self-publishing, you know, publishing on social media or using the internet or just finding other tools, looking for ways to collab, looking for a grant, like there's just a lot of options out there. So, I mean, if at first you don't succeed, <laughs> <laughs> try, try again is really honestly the best advice I can give in this situation. So I would like to read to you a few pages of my upcoming book, The Most Beautiful Thing I Have Ever Seen. It will be published by Second Story Press in 2023. My first home was in a hot, faraway place. I always had other children to play with, besides my bossy sister. We had lots of fun and plenty of food. But one day, the party stopped. We had to stay inside because bad things were happening all around us. There were loud noises everywhere, and they made Mama cry. That was the saddest thing I had ever seen. One night, Mama woke up and told us to be very quiet. 
She bundled us outside to a waiting van. Some of our neighbors were already inside. I tried to stay awake, but I was so tired. In the morning light, I saw many destroyed buildings all around us. We were taken to a tiny crowded room. Everyone was serious all of the time. Then one day, mama became very excited. She packed what we had left in a suitcase. We're gonna live in North America, she said. I didn't know where that was. I don't wanna go, I told her. You can stay here if you want, but I'm going, said my bossy sister. She might've been joking, but I wasn't so sure. A stranger drove us to the airport. We stood in line and they x-rayed our suitcase. There were thousands of people heading in every direction. We boarded a huge shiny airplane. Mama let me have the window seat. Puffy white clouds, some shaped like animals, guided with us in the sky. It was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. I drifted along with the clouds until I fell asleep. In the morning, Mama gently woke me. Our plane had landed. We gathered our belongings and left through the exit. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait for you to read the rest of it. Tansay Ambawashde, Machajane Heather Owach. Hello, good day. My name is Heather Owach. I'm Korean Nakota from the Okanese First Nations located in Treaty 4 territory here in Southern Saskatchewan. I'm a current graduate student taking my master's in public policy at the University of Saskatchewan, and I also work in the philanthropic sector. I've been writing for as long as I can remember, probably all of my life. I we used to write as a child, short stories, poems. I used to keep a journal um, and I would write stories and ideas and, and experiences down all the time. That inspiration comes from being an auntie. I am an auntie to wonderful nieces and nephews. And so having that opportunity in those moments to sit down and share stories and, and create stories with them and have experiences with them um, has been a big inspiration to uh, my book, Auntie's Red Surprise. When I was in high school, actually, I wanted to publish my first book when I graduated. And so high school came and went, and I never got around to publishing the book or even knowing where to start. So I had told myself that eventually, and when I'm in university, I would like to um, write and publish a book. And it wasn't until I actually graduated in my undergrad in 2020, where I was walking my dog, and I had said to myself, you know what, I'm going to write this story, I'm going to write a story, and I'm going to publish it in one year's time. And I really had this goal and this mission as I'm walking my dog in the park. And I started Googling on my phone um, ways to um, get involved in programming or events or, or writing groups. And I came across the Saskatchewan Writers Guild from here in the province. And I was in contact with them. And they had an Indigenous Writers Mentorship Program. And so fast forwarding to a few months, I applied for the Indigenous Writership Men Mentorship Program. And um, I was paired with a wonderful Indigenous author here from Saskatchewan. And for six months, we worked on the idea uh, and developed a story, which eventually turned into Auntie's Red Surprise. And that idea came from that same walk that I was having when I was walking my dog. That story and that idea came when I was thinking about the kinship and the experiences and the shared history of Indigenous peoples and communities that we have with our relatives, our four-legged relatives. And so that same idea developed into a beautiful story. And that story went into a writer's contest through the Second Story Press's Indigenous Writing Contest. And that's where Auntie's Red Surprise is today. Um, I was one of the winners for the writing contest and I received a publishing contract. So Auntie's Red Surprise will be out in 2023 and you'll have an opportunity to listen and to read uh, and to hear um, the storyline of Auntie's Red Surprise. Some of my favorite topics that I like to write about is experiences, ideas, shared history, and anything in regards to my identity. My identity as a First Nations woman, as a Cree and Nakota woman from Southern Saskatchewan, I have experiences that have all been written down or that I would like to eventually write down. And 
you know, writing about my identity and my culture and my language and, and my relationships and my values, such as kinship, um, have all been a part of uh, huge inspirations to my writing and, and to some of the subjects that I like to write about. Um, I would love to continue um, writing children's books and delving into poetry as well and, and, and really um, being a part of um, recording many of the, of the long held stories um, that we as in communities have. And so that is also an inspiration to the writing that I also do. Um, my writing process starts from an idea, starts from an experience. It also starts from a feeling or a moment. And oftentimes I write those feelings, those experiences, and that idea down in my cell phone on my notes, or I'll write it in my laptop on a Word document, or I'll write it in a notebook. I have tons of notebooks laying around where I often write things down. And sometimes I'll start writing then and there, or maybe not. Sometimes I'll just write a, a sentence or two or an idea and months later I'll flick through my notebook and I'll see it and I'll have an inspiration to write about it. Or I'll have a feeling that comes up and I'll, I'll know that I wrote it down somewhere related to that and I go back to it and I write it. So it's very free flowing and, and flexible in the, in the sense of how I write. It's extremely important to have a a great support system and to be involved in building communities with other writers. I recently experienced a writer's retreat here in Saskatchewan through the Saskatchewan Writers Guild. And it was such a wonderful experience. There's about nine of us that came from all walks of life here in Saskatchewan. We got together for a weekend, we, we wrote, we, we networked, we laughed, we cried, and more importantly, we shared our writing. And through that bond that we created in that space, we ended up, you know, becoming a writing group after that. So collectively now, once a month, the writing group gets together and we do the same thing that we did at the retreat. And I think that's so um, foundational and fundamental to, um, to being a writer is the, having those spaces. And so I encourage anyone that is interested in writing children's books and that is interested in writing is that you take your inspiration um, and you look for others that also have the same feelings and inspirations and you create that bond in those spaces because that's going to be foundational to uh, continuing writing. Um, Auntie's Red Surprise talks about the kinship that Indigenous peoples have with our four-legged relatives, our, the dogs. And so we have this long shared history in our communities with dogs, and it's important to continue to share that with the rest of the world. Throughout the book, Auntie's Red Surprise, there's an auntie that's very eccentric, such as myself, um, that that has, a, has come to this to visit this niece and there's a surprise. And as auntie is talking with, with her niece, the niece starts to guess what it is. And in this moment, there is a moment of revealing of the surprise, which is a puppy. And as the puppy is revealed, um, auntie has an opportunity to talk with, with, with her niece on um, what the relationship's like and what it's like to be kind and, and, and the kinship and how how you um how you take care of a relative like that and so there is a really teaching educational moment within the book that talks about animal welfare and i think it's critical um to uh to, to explain that through our traditional um long shared history that we have with 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 our four-legged relatives um and so Auntie's Red Surprise has all of that. And it has some moments of laughter. It has some moments of, of, of really intimate teaching moments. But it also has some moments um, that you yourself as an auntie, maybe as a mother, maybe as a teacher, see an opportunity to connect with, with children. So thank you for allowing me to share my upcoming book. Please take a look at Second Story Press's website for the upcoming book launch for Auntie's Red Surprise. With that, Pinamaya Kenanasko Mitin. Uh, my name is Prajvala Dixit. Um, I am a storyteller who works in journalism, in doc filmmaking, uh, in uh, theater, as well as uh, now I'm an author. 
Um, and uh, often my story is straight to marry the two worlds I belong to, India and Canada. Um, I, uh, I am in St. John's and I've lived here on the island for, um, for over a decade, nearly 12 years. Uh, but my roots uh, go back to Bengaluru, uh, Karnataka, India. Um, and that's where uh, my other half of the family is. So I have one, one side living here and the other side living there. So I call both spaces my home. Um, and, uh, and the book that we're talking about today is called The Tales of Dweepa. Um, it is published by Breakwater Books and has been uh, illustrated by Duncan Major. I, uh, I, I'm a computer engineer by education. Um, I moved from writing code to writing uh, words. Um, I've uh, enjoyed both and, uh, and I find each, each sort of, um, each sort of influences the other in some ways. Um, though I write more words than I write more code today. Um, uh, engineering brought me to Canada. I came here to pursue my master's in a blend between engineering and business at Memorial University um, in a graduate program. And uh, post that, uh, I worked in several odd jobs, nothing related to computer engineering. Um, and then I became a mother. And uh, I would read books to my daughter and often uh, especially when she turned around one and a half to we'd flip the pages and she'd look for herself in those stories and she she'd ask where's Maya uh, no brown where's Maya uh, because she's brown not as dark as me uh, but but she is she is brown too um, and that got me thinking about um, and I'd also go to stores as well as you know uh, other places where books are offered um, and it's changed now in the last four or five years there's been a, a massive shift um, I wouldn't say massive but there's been a shift for sure but at least five years ago four or five years ago it was that wasn't the case so that got me thinking about I could either sit and complain <laughs> be like oh there's no books for my child or I could do something about it. Uh, and I'm more a doer than a complainer. <laughs> so um, while I was growing up in India, uh, the Panchatantra, uh, which have which have been written by Pandit Vishnu Sharma, uh, they were um, they're anthropomorphized uh, children's stories. Um, and and while it's told to children, there's a lot to learn for adults too. Um, and uh, they were written thousands of years ago, passed down orally, and now each has their own sort of different, um, like they're retold in different languages, uh, as animated shows, as TV shows. They're found on railway station platforms. Well, I was growing up for five rupees, so. That would be a splurge uh, one one day to go the, go to the railway station and pick up uh, the cheap copy of Panchatantra and read it, um, or it'd be a gift from from an uncle and aunt or my parents for a birthday. Um, but the first time I heard the Panchatantra was from my grandmothers, uh, and both of them uh, ha have been incredible influencers as storytellers. So I wanted to take the stories of Panchatantra and uh, set it in today's world uh, and today's world in, with a North American Canadian context, um, adding the flavor uh, of the languages that I have encountered in these 30 odd years of my life, uh, the various languages that, that I have encountered, including the Newfoundland dialect, uh, which is its own very, um, beast and uh, culture. Uh, so I wanted to weave all of that through um, characters that are more relatable to kids um, uh, here as well as there. Um, so for instance, 
the story of the crocodile and the monkey um, turned into the story of the tale of the orca and the chipmunk. But not just that, the orca is vegetarian. And uh, it was also one of the, it was the first tra transgender character I've written. Uh, so, uh, uh, so their story and their coming out and their acceptance of themselves as well as them voicing who they are, all of that is, uh, is conveyed through the original structure of the story, but the ending and how it unfolds is a little different. Um, I was very mindful that I uh, wanted to convey themes of social justice of um, racism, of uh, ableism, of sexism, of um, what else, uh, of, uh, of being of different genders, of being of different colors, intercultural friendships and relationships, um, all of that through these stories, uh, while keeping the, the outer structure of the original stories alive. And, uh, and yeah, that's how the tales of Dwipa were born. Dwipa, it comes from a Sanskrit word called, which translates to island. And uh, essentially the title is the tales of an island. I want to quickly mention that the stunning illustrations for this book have been done by Duncan Major. Um, he has conceived such an interesting uh, picture scape for the book. This is the, the Trump-like wolf, and the story is called The Tale of the Hare and the Wolf. And this is Hari the Hare, and this is Onti Tola the Wolf. Um, and he's quite menacing, as you can see. Um, I think there's, this is, this is for my daughter, so that she never asks, is there a brown character in the books she reads? This is Mima. Um, and the book follows the journey of Mima, Nina, and Lok um, across the island of Dwipa. Um, Mima is about eight or ten. Uh, Lok is a Labrador retriever, and Nina is a Newfoundland dog. Uh, and everyone on the island speaks Bhashe, the language of the island, and that's how they communicate. Uh, every living creature can talk to each other. So there's, uh, and, and that, that happens if you're in sync with the ecosystem. When you're not, you speak off indifferently. Um, so um, they all can communicate and are in, living in harmony. Um, and uh, every story is interrelated, which keeps in structure with the Panchatantra. One story leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Um, and uh, every story is, is sort of uh, an adventure that the trio, Mima, Nina, and Lok, uh, are discovering their island, Mipa. Um But yeah, that was Mima. And I just want to quickly show you some more stunning illustrations that uh, Duncan's done. This is a meadow vole, uh, a mice-like, rat-like creature offering Towtons to a caribou, Bara Singa, um, whose herd are now in her space and they're finding a new home. Um, and this is, this is one of the most loved characters from the puppet show. Uh, this is Timmy and their best friend, Ali, the chipmunk. And Timmy is taking Ali to meet their pod. Um, when uh, that's that's the that's what's happening in the story when you see this picture um yeah so i just wanted to show you that and uh, um and uh, explain that this book wouldn't be possible without duncan's contribution um illustrators are are so are so so a picture speaks louder than a thousand words although we're dealing with words here uh but the pictures are so very important in this in this world and book um yeah, Duncan and, uh, and of course, uh, my grandmothers, I want to say a big shout out to all grandmothers. I know they're all storytellers in some way, shape or form. Um, and, uh, and when you pass down stories, you're passing down legacy, you're passing down inheritance. And that's one of the first inheritances I received from my, uh, the matriarchs in my family. 
and uh, I'm, I hope I do justice to to them and uh, and their energy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me again. Have you noticed when the weather gets warm, many little creatures are around. They are almost everywhere, in forests, fields, gardens, soil, fresh water, even our homes or other animals' nests. They fly, walk, some can jump or swim. They look tiny as invaders, but they could be powerful when they work together in a group. What are they? They are insects. So many and beautiful, aren't they? I have a question for you. Are insects animals? The answer is yes. Insects are in the sub-animals, sub-group called Aspropoda, with their cousins, for example, ticks, spiders, lobsters. Those are not insects. Insects are the most diverse animals on the earth. So far, about one million insect species have been identified. It's the three times of all other animal species combined. Still, many more millions remain unknown based on scientists' estimates. Insects are essential to ecosystems. They eat dead bodies, both plants and animals. So they are decomposers. You know bees, they are well-known pollinators, but many other insects, they are pollinators too. They feed, insects feed on plants. Some are predators. For example, dragonflies, they hunt during their flight. Some are parasites living in other animals' body. They are food to many, many others. For example, small mammals, birds, and fish. This is the fish we are familiar with, Atlantic salmon. Young salmon live in fresh water. They feed on tiny water fleas, worms, and many, many insects. Imagine without the insects, what would happen to salmon or even to us? Insects are no question crucial to our survival, but often they are ignored and undervalued. The population has rapidly declined and a third of the known species has been threatened in extinction because of what? Because of human activities. For example, the overuse of insecticides and pesticides, the increasing artificial life fragments and a continuous invasion to their habitats, their homes. If you have a close look, you may find more impacts from humans and make the list longer. Losing insects equals losing the essential services to lives, but not many people are aware of this. Let's have a close look at insects. Adult insects have a three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen, six jointed legs, 
and the wings attach on the thorax. Remember these three body parts and the six jointed legs are the insect's identity. Most insects have four growing stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult, like this beautiful monarch butterfly. But some only have three stages, egg, new, adult, like these uh, crickets. Baby crickets look like the parents or the adults, but they don't have wings. Their wings gradually appear and grow up to the adult stage. Another question is, how many wings do adult insects have? Most insects have four wings, but some have two. Some have no wings at all. For example, butterfly and moths have beautiful four wings. Mosquitoes, many flies, deer fly, black fly, house fly, they only have two wings. They didn't win the, the other two wings, but their back wings shrink to little barbs called halters to maintain the balance and the rotation during the flight. It's so smart design. Beetles have four wings, but the front wings become shells to protect the dedicated light wings and the abdomen. We often say, June bug, ladybug, but they are typical beetles. This was what I studied for my master thesis at the St. Mary University. Black white weevil, a beetle without wings. You can tell from uh, the photo. The shell wings are fused together, so black white weevil cannot fly, but is good at walking. The other interesting about the black red beetle is, so far, no any single male has a farm. They're all females. They lay unfertilized eggs and eggs hand to daughters. The babies or the larvae, the fat one, feed underground and uh, feed underground on roots of many plants, for example, strawberry, blueberry. They cause serious damage or even kill the plants. My study focused on using plant volatiles. Plant volatiles are the compounds released from plants to either repair or to attract adult animals to cure to control the population without using insecticide. No matter if they have wings or without wings, insects are beautiful and amazing animals. Remember, they are crucial to our survival. I hope you spend more time outdoors to watch them. I am sure you will find some interesting things about insects. Don't be surprised if in fall you see a black malibu sneaking into your house for a warm place to overwinter. Being a retired entomologist, I feel as an owner and my obligation of writing a non-fiction children's book about the charm, the beauty, and the truth of insects. The writing is still under very early stage, so it's hard to say when it will be published, but I will keep you posted and update my website regarding the publication. Thank you again. Hello, bonjour. My name is Valerie Wood. 
My pronouns are she, her, elle, and I live in Ottawa, an unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. I'd like to start off by expressing how honored I am to be a part of the Hackmatack Future Voices Showcase, especially in the company of so many other wonderful emerging Canadian BIPOC authors and illustrators. So, a little about me. I'm a first-time author with my children's book, V in Between, set to be published with Second Story Press in May 2023, illustrated by Angela Poon. Outside of writing, I'm a curator at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa. Originally, V in Between was written for my MA in Public History at Carleton University, specifically as a component of my thesis project, which examined the ways in which children's literature can serve as a tool in sharing complex histories, such as the history of Chinese adoption and migration to Canada. However, it's a project that has interested me since my childhood, when as a Chinese-Canadian adoptee and avid reader, I struggled to find a representation of my experiences that felt authentic. Adding my voice and perspective to this body of work has been a long-standing aspiration of mine. V in Between tells the story of V, a young Chinese girl who has been adopted by a white Canadian couple as she navigates her complex racial and cultural identities. V's loving parents help her understand her past and racial identity as well as they can, and for the questions they can't answer, V finds comfort in talking to the moon, which she imagines connects her to her Chinese birth mother. When V takes up Chinese dance, she feels alienated from her parents for the first time and as she throws herself into dance, she becomes painfully aware of the precarious nature of being racialized in her white Canadian family and community. She is finally comforted by her dance teacher, an older Chinese adoptee, who helps V understand herself as being somewhere in between all the overlapping identities she holds. Now I'd like to read the first few pages of the book. V loved hearing stories about her adoption and the trip her parents took to China to bring her home. On their first night together as a family, V's mom couldn't sleep and stared at baby V as she lay in her crib all night long. Her dad laughed about how hard it was to balance a baby in one arm and eat with chopsticks with the other. V knew that somewhere in China, she had a birth family who loved her too. Sometimes she wished she knew more about her birth mother. I've heard that if you want to talk to your birth mother, her mom told her one night, all you have to do is talk to the moon. The moon will listen and when your birth mother goes to sleep, she'll hear you in her dreams. When V wanted to talk to her birth mother, she opened her curtains, letting the moonlight spill into her bedroom. She whispered messages to the moon to pass along to her birth mother. Although a work of fiction, this book is rooted in my own experiences of transracial Chinese-Canadian adoption. V's concerns and struggles mirror my own, and the insight offered by V's dance teacher reflects the incomplete resolution I wish I could share with my younger self. Certain details of V's family life and episodes in the book are drawn directly from my life. Chinese-Canadian adoption peaked in the early 2000s, and V in between speaks to this unique period in Chinese and Canadian histories. Its appeal and interest, however, are broad. In addressing issues of transracial adoption in general, the book adds to a small body of literature on the topic written by adoptees themselves. By centering the story of a young Chinese-Canadian girl facing complex questions of racial and cultural belonging, it invites readers of all ages to think critically about the experiences of Chinese-Canadians, which is especially important in the current climate and increased violence and racism against Asians in Canada and abroad. I also hope that this book will resonate with Chinese-Canadian adoptees of my own age group who want to reflect on their own journey through the in-between find comfort in the story, and perhaps share it with the children in their lives. Thanks for listening, and a special thank you to the Hackmatack team. I hope you all give V in between a read when it comes out next year. Hi there, my name is Michelle Wang, author of a children's picture book series about the four seasons. I was born, raised, and still live in Toronto, Ontario. Many years ago, I was teaching grade one and wanted to find a storybook about the signs of autumn. But when I went to the library, I could only find non-fiction books on the topic. While the pictures were gorgeous and the information was interesting, I really wanted a book I could read aloud to the students that would be fun, engaging, and interactive. But at the time, it didn't seem to me as if this existed. I ended up bringing the class outside for a fall walk and then used the non-fiction books for research guides as an introduction to the lesson. We had a great time, learned lots, and then weeks later, we moved on to the next big thing, never having found that perfect fall storybook. But by that time, I guess you could say that the idea was planted in my mind. 
about this story but that I wished to read but could not find. I started thinking, hmm, maybe I should be writing this book. Having read hundreds of books to my students and thousands of books as a kid, when my parents would bring my two sisters and I to the public library every Saturday with our grocery bags full of books to return so that we could each borrow 10 more books for the week, I figured I had a pretty good idea of what I thought was a good book. I've always loved playing with words, so I think it was the rhyme that came first to me, and then the rest of the ideas pretty quickly after that. And then that was the end of the anything quick to do about the book, as babies, and life happened. Fast forward to the pandemic and lockdown world where every other person, including your dentist's brother's dog, published a book, and well, here's mine. It must be autumn. On Sunday, Mother looked out the window and saw the leaves had changed colors. It must be autumn, she said. I'd better go and get ready. How do leaves change color every year? It happens automatically. So Mother went outside and looked at the leaves. I know just what to do, she said with a smile. I'll shake them and rake them and take them and make them into a great big pile. What did the leaves say to Autumn? I'm falling for you. On Monday, Father looked out the window and saw the birds flying south. It must be Autumn, he said. I'd better go and get ready. Why do birds fly south in the fall? Because it's too far to walk. So Father went outside and looked at the birds and the leaves. I know just what to do, he said with a grin. I'll shake them and rake them and take them and make them into a great big pile. What did the tree say to his best friend? I believe in you. On Tuesday, Sister looked out the window and saw the squirrels gathering nuts. It must be autumn, she said. I'd better go and get ready. What kind of nut doesn't have a shell? A donut. So Sister went outside and looked at the squirrels, the birds, and the leaves. I know just what to do, she said with a chortle. I'll shake them and rake them and take them and make them into a great big pile. What did the squirrel say to his girlfriend? I'm nuts about you. On Wednesday, Brother looked out the window and saw the days were getting shorter. It must be Autumn, he said. I'd better go and get ready. What did Summer say to Autumn? Are you following me again? So Brother went outside and looked at the earlier sunset, the squirrels, the birds, and the leaves. I know just what to do, he said with a guffaw. I'll shake them and rake them and take them and make them into a great big pile. What is a tree's least favorite month of the year? September. On Thursday, Grandmother looked out the window and saw the temperature getting colder. It must be autumn, she said. I'd better go and get ready. Why don't trees like going back to school in the fall? Because they're easily stumped. So Grandmother went outside all bundled up and looked at the earlier sunset, the squirrels, the birds, and the leaves. I know just what to do, she said with a chuckle. I'll shake them and rake them and take them and make them into a great big pile. How do trees get on the internet? They log on. On Friday, Grandfather looked out the window and saw the apples and vegetables ready to harvest. It must be autumn, he said. I'd better go and get ready. What do you use to fix a jack-o'-lantern? A pumpkin patch. So after munching on an apple, Grandfather went outside all bundled up and looked at the earlier sunset, the squirrels, the birds and the leaves. I know just what to do, he said with a giggle. I'll shake them and rake them and take them and make them into a great big pile. What do you get when you drop a pumpkin? Squash. On Saturday, everyone looked out the window with a smile, a grin, a chortle, a guffaw, a chuckle, and a giggle. It must be autumn, they said. How do you start a tree race? On your bark, get set, grow. So mother, father, sister, brother, grandmother, and grandfather all ran outside into the beautiful autumn afternoon. We know just what to do, they shouted. We shook them and raked them and took them and made them into a great big pile. Now we are ready. What happens when winter comes? Autumn leaves. Happy fall, y'all. Once It Must Be Autumn was published, it seemed natural that there should be It Must Be Winter and the other seasons too. But as with all great plans, there comes a great plot twist, an invasion of a Ukrainian illustrator's country as she was working on the spring book. 
Liliana Barabash, a wonderfully talented illustrator, has continued to send through beautiful artwork even as she lives through air raid warnings and strike points in her city. In support of her, all my author proceeds of the sales of these first two books will be donated to Ukrainian humanitarian relief efforts until it must be spring finally arrives. These books are available from Chapters Amazon and directly from my website, itmustbebooks.com. They are also currently on the shelves of the Sudbury and Peterborough libraries, ready for the next generation of grocery bag toting kids to discover and borrow. Thanks for including me in your Future Voices Showcase. I hope you enjoy reading these as much as I enjoyed creating them. Wait, Deloise and Nyanza Julian. My name is Nyanza Julian. I am from Millbrook First Nation um, here in Mi'kmaq, and I am the author and illustrator of Come Walk With Me. So sharing uh, why I started writing and when I started writing, um, I've really written my entire life. When I was a little girl, me and my mom used to write letters all the time um, because I'm the youngest of six kids. So sometimes that was our best way to communicate with one another. Um, I also like to write through school and um, as well as draw. And it's something that's been around in my life. Um, for as long as I can remember. Uh, and I remember reading Robert Munch books when I was a little girl and being like, oh, how cool it, would it be to like have a book written either like about me or with the people that I love in it. Um, and I've actually been able to do that with Come Walk With Me um, and include a lot of people from my community um, as well as my nation. Uh, there's been a lot of hard times in the last two years with COVID and the fishing disputes picking up on the South Shore. And um, during the fishing disputes, I actually was um, recognized by my publisher who reached out and really encouraged me quite a few times to like put something to paper. And I was kind of hesitant at first, but then um, in the mid fall, probably, um, I really honed in on doing some work and and I decided that I was going to write and publish and the, the process of my book come walk with me um it was actually incredibly quick I did it from fall to winter uh probably less than three months writing illustrating everything um there's definitely some mistakes within the book um specifically on the teachings that I've included. Um, some of them are not actually the uh, sacred grandmother and grandfather teachings of the Mi'kmaq people. Some of them are actually the seven sacred teachings of other tribes across Canada uh, or Turtle Island. And uh, that was a mistake that I really was harsh on myself about. But um, as I've grown, I've kind of learned to accept that mistakes happen and it's better to put one foot forward and keep going and uh, really try to get to a better understanding of myself and, and how I made mistakes and how I really shined and what I could do to better future books, uh, which I do plan to write. Um, I've been in a little bit of a creative block but I am still very sure that this is something that I would like to take forward within my life. Um, I'm really interested in doing some poetry work, so I'm hoping that that will be um, on the horizon. And I'm really grateful to have been contacted to be a part of this. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read a little bit of Come Walk With Me. I'm just gonna open to a random page and go from there. Um, our men are providers. Protectors and physical strength. Our two-spirited people show us true courage and love every day. Our elders most sacred, they show us the way. From resistance, Maoyomis, 
or braids in my hair. Ceremonial leaders. Feeding. Weaving baskets. Or just having time to spare. So that's all I'm going to read. Something that's really important within my writing and within my future plans is to spread love and light wherever I go. Um, I've been on an intergenerational healing journey for quite some time now. Uh, within the last year and a half, I've really slowed down and taken some time off for myself um, to heal generational wounds um, and kind of adjust my perspective on life. Um, and I just really want to encourage other uh, young people and even older people, really people of all ages, to uh, get out there and do the work and, and understand that you won't regret it. It may get hard sometimes, you may want to quit, but I promise that doing the hard work is definitely worth it. And healing has brought me so many good things, including um, my book itself and the connections that I've built with this book. Uh, and a really interesting part uh, that I would like to mention is that when I was creating Come Walk With Me, I actually did all of the illustrations on my iPhone um, on a drawing app. And that was definitely difficult, um, especially transferring them from the iPhone to the computer and trying to get them to the right size. Um, so if you see some blurriness in some of the pictures, that's why um, it's definitely not the same process that I would use going forward, but was amazing um, to prove to myself that I could do it on my phone as well as uh, as well as just actually getting it done and sitting down and taking the time to do the illustrations. Um, I'm really thankful for my partner at the time as they had taken a lot of the uh, stress off of me by helping with household chores and really supporting me within my dreams and pushing me to uh, accomplish the best that I could. Um, so I'm very grateful for that, uh, as well as the other loved ones in my life who had helped make this dream a reality and put forth belief in me that I sometimes lacked about myself. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for including me and my book Come Walk With Me in Hackman Attack's Future Voices Showcase um, 2022 and I hope that you purchase a copy of my book at amazon.ca or eaglespeaker.com. Walalin. Walalioch.